of order, Ruth Dyson. Um, point of order, Mr Speaker, and I'm not doing this to trifle with your earlier considerations, but I'm doing it because the Minister responsible for the bill is now in the chair. The point of order that I raised earlier, and I now wish to repeat and seek further guidance for you, is that because this bill was introduced as part of another bill which is still at Select Committee, this part this part of the bill has been taken out of the Select Committee process and is now before the Committee of the Whole House under urgency going through all stages. Yep. Okay. We I'm, don't I, have I am... the benefit of the officials' advice. And I... Now, the first thing that Ruth Dyson will resume her chair, the member who interjected while I was on my feet will stand up, withdraw and apologise. Withdraw and apologise. Withdraw and apologise. Withdraw and apologise, yes. Thank you, Mr Bennett. Um, and I am ready to rule uh, on this. Uh, I have previously ruled, and I think the first time the matter was raised, the Minister was, in fact, in the House when it was raised by uh, Jan Logie. Uh, and what I ruled at the time is uh, that if, if um, I suggested the chair of the committee um, uh, and it would have to be a committee member, I think, to, 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 to have the material, um, excise that material from a report and sought leave of the House in particular terms so that members were able to debate it, uh, then, um, then it would be up to the House. It would have to be a unanimous decision of the House. Uh, members would be able to. Um, no one has done that, uh, and therefore I'm going to rule that uh, I've got nothing further to rule on. Mr. Chris Hipkins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I wanted to deal with a number of issues in this contribution. The first of which, um, as I note, uh, in um, that this bill, clause three, refers to the Principal Act, and it says that the, the bill amends the Social Security Act of 1964. And I'm going to refer to many of the comments that I make to the actual original Act in the part that we're amending. But I do want to note at the outset of that that the Ministry of Social Development website notes that there is actually a full rewrite of that uh, legislation underway, and that it was due in the House by the end of 2015. Uh, and I wonder, in fact, whether that has highlighted other areas that might need to be addressed that the Minister may want to, to uh, alert the House to. But the reason that I'm referring to the Principal Act is I uh, wanted to check with the Minister on what basis the Government are claiming that the wording in the Act was inconsistent with the policy intent at the time these amendments, the, the original amendments in 1998, were passed. And the reason that I ask that is we are amending clause uh, 80BA4, um, and if you look at 80BA3, the clause immediately prior to section. that, was that? The section. The section, sorry, immediately prior to that, that defines when a stand down period begins. So the, the, the clauses that we're amending. Uh, amend when a stand-down period ends. But if you look at when a stand-down period begins, it's actually very clear. If a person's employment um, is terminated or the person is given notice of termination of employment before he or she applied for the benefit, the day after the date the, the person's employment ceased. So in that clause, it's very clear that it's the day after that the stand-down period begins. But then the very next clause, which was in exactly the same amendment, the same bill that amended the Act, it, which is the one that we are now amending, it goes on to say that the stand-down period ends the day on which the stand-down period ends. Now, it seems to me that if the policy intent in the original drafting was to make that differentiation, or it was to make no differentiation, why was a different form of words used in the drafting of the Act? So really the question that I have for the Minister is why, on what basis are they claiming that this was incorrect, that the legislation was incorrect, not the application of the legislation being, in, w w being incorrect? Now if the application was being incorrect, or had, had been incorrect, then I don't think that there is any justification for the government to retrospectively go back and try and change the law to make right an incorrect interpretation of the Act as intended by the agency that was implementing it. On the other hand, 
if it was that the policy, there, there may be some uh, justification if it was a genuine drafting error in the legislation, but I struggle to accept that when the clause immediately prior makes a clear differentiation between the day on which and the day after. Now that may all seem, uh, for, for anyone following along at home, they'll probably think, what on earth is he talking about? Uh, but actually it is quite important because it comes down to the issue of fairness and whether in fact uh, this was a mistake by the agency implementing the law and that they interpreted the law incorrectly, or whether it was a mistake made in the passage of the law in the first place. And I think, uh, given you know, very uh, careful scrutiny of the original act, I'm actually falling uh, in, the, in the category that it's the former, which is that it's actually a mistake in the way the law has been interpreted by um, the Ministry in its implementation. And therefore, I don't think that there is good grounds to retrospectively change. Now, if the government is saying they are now changing the policy intent to bring those two things into line, that's a legitimate call for the government to make. And they, and they can pass that legislation going forward into the future. They would bring the two clauses, it would make the two clauses consistent. But what is the rationale, other than it being a fiscal cost to the government because the agency implementing this have made a mistake in incorrecting the, the, uh, and incorrectly interpreting the law, there can't actually be a justification for amending the law retrospectively in the way that the government is seeking to do through this bill. Because the mistake is in the interpretation of the, the law, not the, the, the law as passed, because the law as passed, it seems to me, made a clear differentiation in its intent and in the way it is drafted between the stand down period beginning and the stand down period commencing. It specified very clearly that the stand down period commenced the day after somebody's employment ceased. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Chair. Chris Hipkins? It, it commenced, <coughs> commenced the day after a, a person's employment ceased. Uh, but the, the, the uh, stand down period only ended or ended on the day the stand down period ended. And therefore, uh, I don't think that there is uh, a, a case to be made to say that it was a drafting error because, of the, because, because the clauses are inconsistent. And that must have been picked up at the time. Uh, this went through a full scrutiny process, I presume, at the time. Uh, and therefore, trying now to say that the policy wasn't incorrectly implemented by the law. I, by, by the drafting of the law, I don't think stands. I think to, it, it's perfectly legitimate for the minister to say that the, um, that the law was incorrectly applied, uh, that the, the law was incorrectly applied by the agency responsible for paying out the benefits. But frankly, I think, who should wear that liability? It was not the mistake of the beneficiaries receiving the money, it was the mistake of the agency. So who should bear the liability for that? Should that liability be with the Crown, the government, the agency responsible, or should that be with the recipients? If it was incorrect uh, application of the law, I don't think it should be the recipients that bear the liability. I think it should be the Crown, the government, the people who made the mistake uh, who, who bear the liability for that. So I'll be interested in hearing further comments from the Minister on that. The Honourable